Welcome to the week three video lecture for Fish and Wildlife Policy Programs and Issues. This week, we will be exploring public attitudes toward wildlife, federal policy toward Native Americans, and new approaches to fisheries conservation. Stephen Keller found 10 distinctive attitudes of Americans toward wildlife. Naturalistic, affection for wildlife in the outdoors. Ecologistic, view the environment as a system with an interest in interrelationships between species and habitats. Humanistic, affection for individual animals, especially pets. Focus on large, attractive animals with anthropomorphic associations. Moralistic, concern for the right and wrong treatment of animals with strong opposition to exploitation and cruelty. Scientistic, interest in the physical attributes and biological functioning of animals. Aesthetic, drawn to the artistic and symbolic characteristics of animals. Utilitarian, concern for the practical and material value of animals. Dominionistic, satisfaction derived from mastery and control of animals. Negativistic, active avoidance of animals due to fear or dislike. And neutralistic, passive avoidance due to indis indifference. Kellert noted that while the frequency of positive feeling and concern for animal welfare in America today is somewhat pleasing to note, the emotional rather than intellectual basis for this interest and its greater focus on pets and limited wildlife species poses some potential problems. Today, wildlife managers must prepare themselves for issues that often deal with conflict. In addition to a background in science, biology, and ecology, managers must also possess an understanding of their responsibility to the species, the population, and the ecosystem in question, understand the views of all interest groups, including those that might influence policies through expression of moralistic, humanistic, or other attitudes, and have an understanding of the various values of the resource and how the resource and the policy toward it complement the total management program. Another key topic this week is government policies toward Native Americans. Following the American Revolution, U.S. government policy was to separate Indians from whites and to place them on allotments or reservations. The Dawes Act opened up extensive Indian reservation land for private land ownership. Government policy was to suppress native rituals and force tribes to become assimilated. Indian Reorganization Act allowed Native Americans to resurrect their culture and traditions lost to government expansion and encroachment. In addition, it provided definitions for Indians and tribes through subsequent amendments, extended to tribes the right to form corporations, established a credit system for Native Americans, granted limited tribal sovereignty, and provided Native Americans with educational opportunities and funds for trade, vocational, elementary, and secondary schools. In 1983, Supreme, the Supreme Court ruled that the Mescalero Apaches had established a comprehensive scheme for fish and wildlife management, thus New Mexico's laws were preempted by federal law. This decision encouraged more state cooperation with tribes over fish and wildlife re resources. The Bolt decision recognized that tribes held an interest in common with the U.S. government. This allowed tribes the opportunity to harvest 50% of fish that would be available above the minimum population requirements for conservation purposes. Increasingly, state agencies and the federal government are working with tribes on developing cooperative management programs. The public trust doctrine is considered the keystone of the North American model of wildlife conservation. It represents the common law foundation for trust status of wildlife resources in the United States. The public trust doctrine infers that the American people own the fish in the exclusive economic zone. The public has a right to fish and wildlife, but nobody can have exclusive ownership of fish and wildlife until it is captured. The government acts as trustee over fish and wildlife resources. The doctrine is traceable to Roman law, where it was concerned with access rather than ownership, since the oceans were open to everyone. Okay. 
Marine managed areas and marine protected areas are multi-use ocean zoning schemes that typically encompass several types of sub-areas, such as no-take areas, buffer zones with particular restrictions, such as no oil drilling, and areas dedicated to specific uses, such as fishing and diving. MMAs and MPAs could take many forms to address different issues and objectives. Marine managed areas typically involve multiple uses such as fishing, diving, and tourism, while marine protected areas tend to restrict all extractive human uses like fishing, mining, oil, and gas drilling. MMAs and MPAs operate under a set of key principles. All human uses and their impacts should be considered and their management integrated. Policy and management based on the best natural and social science available. And all stakeholders should be consulted and fully involved in the policy and management development and implementation process.